You ready for the word? Yes, sir. Turn to Genesis 15. Look in verse 1. After these things, the word of Yahweh came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And Abram said, and here's one of those places uh, King James does some weird stuff, rather than uh, making all the letters of the word Lord capital, they made all the letters of the word God capital, so that you'd know that the word translated God is actually the tetragrammaton, which is the word Yahweh. Uh, the word Lord there is Adonai. So Abram said, Adonai Yahweh. Is what he said. Adonai Yahweh, what will, you, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. It's worth noting before we go on that they translated the word steward from two words. Two Hebrew words. One of them is bain, which means son. And the other is uh, meshek, which means to hold or to possess. So... Here's what Abram actually said to Yahweh. The son holding possession of my house is Eleazar. The son holding possession of my house is Eleazar. And Abram said, Behold, to me you have given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. Restating to Yahweh that Eleazar is the heir because he has no one else to uh, bequeath his stuff to. Verse 4. And behold, the word of Yahweh came unto him, saying, This shall not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. <clears throat> and he brought him uh, forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, actually number the stars, if you be able to number them, and he said unto him, So shall your seed be. And he, Abram, believed in Yahweh. And he, Yahweh, counted it to him for righteousness. <clears throat> Yahweh spoke to Abraham. Abraham spoke to Yahweh. We don't need to read over that or past that and just go to whatever comes up next. We need to focus on the point here that Abram and Yahweh are communicating. The Most High is communi communicating with a man, and a man named Abram is communicating with the Most High. From the beginning of Genesis, we see that Yahweh intended to communicate with his creation. He spoke to Adam. Uh, we know that Adam and Kavah were walking through the garden in the cool of the day, and they heard the voice of Yahweh calling out to them. In Genesis 6, in our study, we saw that Yahweh said to Abram, excuse me, Yahweh said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come upon me. It's come to me. Uh, you need to build an ark out of gopher wood. The, Yahweh spoke to Noah. In Genesis 12, 1, we were told that Yahweh had said, pre, uh, past tense, Yahweh had said to Abram, get out of your country from your kindred, from your father's house, onto the land that I will show you. So Yahweh, from the beginning, has shown that he communicates with man, and he wants man or mankind to communicate with him. Our text this morning not only shows us uh, that, that Yahweh is communicating, but I think it reveals to us how he communicates and how we can or should communicate with him. So let's take a, a look at what it reveals so that our ability to hear him and our ability to communicate back to him is greatly increased or at least improved. <clears throat> Go back with me to verse 1. And let's pay attention to exactly what it says. Because you know the, the scriptures don't just throw words around. If it says something a specific way, it's saying that specific way for a specific reason. So we need, we need to pay particular attention to the words that are used in verse 1. Did Yahweh appear to Abram in a vision and speak to him? Look at verse 1 and tell me. Did Yahweh appear to Abram in a vision and speak to him? 
No. <clears throat> that's not what we're told. I think that's the way most of us wish it would happen. We wish he would appear to us when we have issues, when we need answers. We wish he'd appear to us in a vision and talk to us. But, but notice it doesn't say Yahweh appeared to Abram in a vision. Yahweh told the children of Israel in um, Numbers chapter 12. He told them if there was a prophet among them, he said, if there is a prophet among you, I will make myself known to him in a vision and I will speak to him in a dream. It's not that way with Moses. With Moses, I speak to him face to face. But if there's a prophet among you, I will make myself known to him in a vision and I will speak to him in a dream. So if you are a prophet, Yahweh will speak to you in visions and dreams. If you're Moses, Yahweh speaks to you face to face. If we're neither, how do we communicate? One way I think is revealed to us here in chapter 15, verse 1 again. Notice what it says. The word of Yahweh came to Abraham in a vision, saying, The word came to Abraham in a vision, saying. The word said something in a vision. The word came in a vision and said something. So let's start with the word translated as came. The word translated as came is the Hebrew word hayah, H-A-Y-A-H, hayah. And that word means to exist, to be, or to become. To exist, to be, or to become. In Genesis 1, 3, Yahweh said, Light, Hayah. Light be. And light, Hayad. Light was. You got that? Light be, light was. Light, Hayah. Light, Hayad. Same word. In Genesis 2, 7, it says, Yahweh breathed into the nostrils of the man, that he had created from the dust of the earth, and man hayad a living soul. He became a living soul. So in Genesis 15, 1, we're told that the word hayad, the word became something. What did the word become? The word became a vision, exactly. And the vision spoke. We have to get this. We have to let this get down on the inside of us. Yahweh's word became something that Abraham could see. And once he saw it, it spoke to him. I'm going to say that again. Yahweh's word became something that Abraham could see. And once he was able to see it, then it could speak to him. I think that that's why verse 1 begins with, after these things. After Abraham's battle with the four kings who had taken Lot uh, captive, after Abram's confrontation with uh, the king of Sodom and, and that whole exchange took place, it helped him to get a vision of what Yahweh had been saying to him all along. Yahweh's word became something that Abraham could see. He could see now on the inside, in his mind, in his heart, however you want to put it, he could see now, after these things, he could see now what it meant when, when Yahweh said, I am your shield. He could see what it meant when Yahweh said, I am your exceeding great reward. And once he could see it, then he could hear on a different level what Yahweh was saying to him. Have you ever had someone, and perhaps it's taking place right now, but have you ever had someone, anyone try to explain something to you and you're having a difficult time following them, having a difficult time understanding or comprehending what they're trying to communicate to you, but they kept on trying to explain it to you, perhaps they simplified it, perhaps they used an illustration, but eventually 
Somehow they got through and you got it. And you said something like this back. I see it. I see what you're saying now. Not I hear what you're saying. But I see what you're saying now. Your ears were hearing the words all along. But you couldn't understand the words until your heart or your mind could see what your ears were hearing. It seems to me that that's what's happening in Genesis 15.1. Yahweh had been saying to Abraham, I'm your shield. I am your exceeding great reward. And Abraham was hearing it with his ears. But after these things, after the battle with the kings, and after the confrontation with the king of Sodom, Abraham was able to see what Yahweh was saying. His words became a vision that spoke to Abraham. <clears throat> Yahweh's word became something that Abraham could see. Here's the point. We read the word over and over. And we hear the word taught over and over and over. But perhaps we're not hearing Yahweh speak directly to us because we never take the time to see what he's trying to say. There's no vision on the inside of us of what it looks like when he speaks. Abram finally had a vision of what it looked like for Yahweh to be his shield. Abraham finally had a vision of what it looked like for Yahweh to be his exceeding great reward. And that vision spoke to him in great power. Let, let me see if I can help us get a vision of what I'm trying to say. Go to Psalm 34. Now you could take any passage in the Bible that's special to you. <clears throat> this particular passage is special to me. Particularly Psalm 34.3. When we began this assembly, almost 20 years ago now, <clears throat> it'll be 20 years in March of this year, of 2022. Uh, we had gone to have some letterheads and things made, and we wanted, you know, what are we going to put on the letterhead? And uh, eventually... <clears throat> sitting out there, pardon me, <clears throat> sitting out there in the parking lot, I knew, I knew what would be on our letterhead. And that was exalting his name. Psalm 34, 3. Oh, magnify Yahweh with me and let us exalt his name together. So this assembly would be about exalting his name. So said all that to say this particular passage means a lot to me. You can meditate on any passage, but read this one with me and let me see if I can communicate to you what I'm trying to share this morning. Verse 1 says, I will bless Yahweh at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in Yahweh. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify Yahweh with me. Let us exalt his name together. Now listen to this. I sought Yahweh and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. From all my fears. What happens if we don't just read that? What would happen if we paused and meditated on it? What does verse 4 look like? What does it look like if you sought Yahweh and he heard you? What does it look like if he delivered you from all of your fears? Interesting word here translated fear. This word means a fear that's lodged deep within and has been stored on the inside of you for a long time. It's not just something that comes upon you and frightens you, but it's a fear somehow or the other that got locked into your being. And it may have been there from your childhood. It may have been there from your teenage years. It may have been there from your early adulthood, but it's been lodged on the inside of you. And here he says, 
I sought Yahweh and he heard me and he delivered me from fears that were lodged inside of me and I didn't know if I could ever get rid of them. What would it look like if Yahweh delivered you from those? If we get a vision of what that looks like, it, it, it creates a faith in us and a hope in us that brings that thing to pass. Get a vision of how it would look to, to be delivered from fear, to be delivered from those fears. Verse 5, they looked upon him and were lightened. Their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and Yahweh heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Again, what does that look like? What does it look like to be saved out of all your troubles? Not saved from troubles. That would be wonderful, but that's not what it says. It says saved out of your troubles, not from troubles. Troubles come. They come to all of us. The word translated trouble there means anguish, anxiety, adversity, affliction. It means to be in a really tight place. It means to be pressed upon. Yahweh, this scripture talks about Yahweh delivering you out of all of that. What does that look like? Could you envision it? Can you envision it? Can you get a picture of Yahweh delivering you from anguish, anxiety, adversity, and affliction in tight places? Or can you only see the trouble? And can you only feel the anguish? If you see the salvation... You will feel what you're seeing. And when you feel what you hear, when you feel what Yahweh is saying to you concerning it, it will change everything about you. The angel of Yahweh encamps around about them that fear him and delivers them. Verse 7. The angel of Yahweh encamps around them that fear Yahweh and delivers them. Can you see that you're surrounded? Or do you feel alone and by yourself and abandoned? Can you see that they which be with you are more than they that be with them, whoever them is? Oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Can you see yourself trusting him? Can you see yourself blessed by him? Can you taste how good he is? Oh, fear Yahweh, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. What does that look like to have no want? The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek Yahweh shall not want any good thing. What does that look like? Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I'll teach you the fear of Yahweh. What man is he that desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil, do good, seek peace, pursue it. The eyes of Yahweh are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of Yahweh is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Can you see... Yahweh fighting your battles for you. The righteous cry and Yahweh hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. You can literally read that and go about your day unchanged. Or you could get in a quiet place and read that and start getting a picture in your mind and in your heart of what it looks like for that to come to pass, it'll change the way you think, it'll change the way you feel, and it'll change the way you can hear. Envisioning those things. When the word of Yahweh becomes a vision to us, it will speak to us about how Yahweh is delivering us out of all of our troubles. Verse 18, Yahweh is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, save such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but Yahweh delivers him out of them all. We can either have a vision of all of our afflictions, or we can have an, a vision of how Yahweh delivers us. This word afflictions is the same word that's translated evil in other places. 
Evil is lack, want, debt, distress, sickness, and disease. So pay attention to what verse 19 says. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Verse 19 is admitting to us that which a lot of um, denominations don't want to admit. The righteous also sometimes have lacks and wants and debts and distresses and sicknesses and diseases. The righteous do. But don't, don't get visions of how that looks and feels and meditate on that. Get a vision on the inside of what it looks like to be delivered out of all of that. Verse 21 says that evil slays the wicked. Lack, want, debt, distress, sickness, and disease will slay the wicked. But we just read a verse that says the righteous get delivered out of the same thing. The righteous sometimes endure lack, want, debt, distress, sickness, and disease, but the righteous get delivered from them. If we don't have a vision of the deliverance, then we become distraught in our afflictions. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. Yahweh redeems the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. So let Yahweh quicken a portion of his word to you, whether it's this word or some other word. Let Yahweh quicken some portion of his word to you, and then let that word become, hayah, let that word become a vision that you see. And when you see it, it will speak to you. When it becomes a vision, it will speak to you in a deeper, more powerful, and more meaningful level. Once you see it, what I'm saying is you hear better. Let's look at an example, I think, of a person who got a vision of a word and how it changed their life. Go to Matthew 9. What did Yahweh tell Joshua to do with the word? With the law. What did he tell him to do? Meditate day and night. <clears throat> Meditate day and night. What is he telling him to do then? To memorize it? Visualize it. See it. Meditate therein day and night. Start getting um, images and pictures of what it means for me to be your Elohim. <clears throat> Get an image on the inside of you what it means for you and I to be friends or to be in covenant with one another. See, Matthew 9 verse 20. And behold a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind Yeshua and touched the hem of his garment. Why did she touch his garment? For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Yeshua turned him about and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. From her words, we see that this woman had a vision on the inside of her. The vision was, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, this thing that's plagued me for 12 years will be over. 12 years. All I got to do is touch his garment and it's over. That's a vision. Where did she get that vision? What created that vision? Is it possible that it came from Malachi chapter 4 verse 2? Malachi 4.2 says this, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. The Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. The word translated wings there means the outer edge or the extremity. If you're talking about a bird, it would mean the wing. But if you're talking about a garment or a person, it would mean the outer edges of his garment. Somehow, whether it's Malachi 4, 2 or not, somehow this woman got a vision that in the edges of Yahshua's garments, in his edges, the edges of that garment, there was healing. Whether it's the zit zit or not, I don't know. But she knew. There was healing there. 
Somehow she got a vision that was healing there. And because of that vision, it spoke to her. And when it spoke to her, she repeated what she heard. And when she repeated what she heard and acted on it, power was released that made her whole that very day. I have, uh, I have had Yahweh speak to me in different ways. Uh, I can sometimes be reading his word and there's a rhema that just comes. It just comes alive. It's... The, fr the phrase sometimes we use is, it's like it leaped off the page. You've had that experience. It's just like you've read it and read it and read it, but that particular time you're just reading it and bam. Rhema, it, it came alive and it set, spoke to you in a different way. I, I, I have been driving down the road before minding my own business. Not particularly thinking about anything. And boom, you hear something in your spirit and you know it was Yahweh that spoke to you. I have been asleep before. Not often. But a few times I've been asleep before. In the early morning hours heard something that was so loud that it woke me up and I sat straight up in bed. Was it audible? I've said it before. I don't know. All I know is it was loud enough to wake me up. And I sat up in bed because I knew Yahweh had spoken to me. There was a time... When we moved to Texas, and we're going, we were, uh, the whole family went there, and Brian, Amanda, and I were going to enroll in Bible school. Things didn't go as planned. We arrived there with uh, no resources. And the day we were supposed to enroll in school, we would owe the school $1,500 just to get started. $1,500. We didn't have $1,500. We arrived in August, school would start in September. I uh, have begun to pray and to meditate on this passage. It says, my Elohim shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. So I locked on that and began to try to get a vision of what that looked like. My Elohim shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Yeshua, the Messiah. I was repeating that uh, to myself every time the thought of that $1,500 came up in my mind because the thought of that $1,500 came up in my mind, it would say, you're going to be embarrassed. You brought your family out here and you got nothing. You, you know, just horrible thoughts would come. So I'd have to replace those with, my Elohim shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory. The Southwest Believers Convention was in Fort Worth at that time. I think it was a couple of weeks before we were enrolled in school, we decided to go. One day while we were there, we ran into a family from Birmingham. We knew who they were, but didn't really know them. Later, I think, it, I don't know whether it was that day or another day, but later in that convention, we saw them again, and they handed us an envelope with a check in it and said they were instructed to give it to us. We thanked them, hugged their neck. I went home, opened the envelope, and there was a check for $500 in there. I knew when I saw that $500, I needed a vision. I, that helped, but it's still $1,000 short. We have no promise of support. We have no promise of anybody wanting to help us. No idea that anybody would help us. So we're still a thousand dollars short. So I go into our bedroom and the mirror above the dresser, I stick that check between the glass and the wood because I need to see it. I stick that check between the glass and the wood and I said to Marie, we need $1,500, but I also know we need groceries. We're going to need to pay utilities. We're going to need gas for the vehicles. Give us our $1,500, and until he gives us our $1,500, no matter what comes in, it's not ours. She agreed. The next day, a check comes in. The next day, a check comes in. 
A day or two later, a check comes in. $25, $50, $100. Every time one would come in, we'd rejoice and stick it on that mirror. We had no idea people were going to send a check, but they did. Nobody promised us they'd send a check, but Yahweh's working on our behalf. We did not know that, that the utility, the, the uh, power company in Alabama owed us money back on our deposit. That check came in. And we went to sticking them in that mirror until it surrounded that whole mirror. And at the end of it all, we looked, pulled them down, counted them up. That was $1,680, if my memory serves me correct. Hallelujah. We take $180 and set it over here and say, that's ours. This $1,500 is for the school. Yahweh supplied our need according to his riches and glory. And to this day, I'm convinced... That what got us there was not taking that $500 and going first and buying groceries with it. And saying, okay, Yahweh, we had to have groceries. Now you supply the, the rest of it. But we put it up there with a vision of saying, he's going to take care of the school and he's going to take care of us. And we're going to look at it every day until he does. I'm telling you that a vision on the inside when you need something from Yahweh is vitally, vitally important. you got to see it to receive it. Amen. All right. So let's go back here to Genesis chapter uh, 15 verse 1. When Yahweh quickens a portion of his word to you, don't take it lightly. He's wanting you not only to read it. He's not only wanting you to hear it. He's wanting you to see it. He wants you to get a vision of what that word look, looks like so that you can hear what he's really saying to you. The word of Yahweh became a vision that spoke. Now that we see one of the ways that Yahweh communicated with Abram. Let me close by briefly taking a look at how Abraham communicated with Yahweh. Because communication is a two way street. Genesis 15 verse 2. And Abram said, Adonai Elohim, what will you give me seeing I go childless? <laughs> and the son holding possession of my house, that's what Stuart means, remember. The son holding possession of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, Listen to him now. Abram said, Behold, to me you have given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. Drop down to verse 8. And he, Abram said, Adonai Yahweh, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? How would you characterize Abram's words to Yahweh. Meek. Passive. Timid. Bold. Bold. He was bold. He was direct. He was honest. And he was sincere. Bold, direct, honest, and sincere. We can learn a lot from that. Our prayers and our communications with Yahweh should never be vague, wishy-washy, uncertain, or timid. They always should be bold, direct, honest, and sincere. Go read the Psalms. David, a man after Yahweh's own heart. Go read the Psalms and see how David communicated with Yahweh. He was always bold, direct, honest, and sincere. And Yahweh loved it. If I can paraphrase what Abram said, here, here's what it is. Yahweh, I can see that you're my shield. I can see that you are my exceeding great reward. But I can also see there is nothing that you can give me, nothing that you can do for me that's going to mean anything unless you also give me an heir. I need a son. As things stand right now, everything that you have given to me will become the possession of a servant born in my house. 
I'm appreciative of what you have done, but my greatest need is a son. Now that's bold, direct, honest, and sincere. And Yahweh answered him. He did not chastise him. He did not say, how dare you? Yahweh answered him. Which makes me wonder. Could it be that sometimes we think Yahweh is not answering our prayers? And if he isn't answering our prayers, could it be because our prayers weren't bold enough? By that I mean... If you go back and look, we really danced around the issue and we never really got around to asking for what we wanted. They weren't bold enough. Could it be they weren't direct enough? That is, our prayer was so vague, the truth of the matter is we wouldn't know if he answered or not. Could it be they weren't honest enough? We didn't really ask for what we wanted to ask for. We asked for what we thought he'd want us to ask for. Could it be they weren't sincere? And by that I mean we tried to pretend that it didn't really matter to us whether he answered us or not. That's insincere. You know, I, th this is what I want, but nevertheless, not what I want, but your will be done. Most of the time, that's insincerity. Here's the instruction that we have from Scripture. In the prayer of Jabez, we're told that Yahweh answered that prayer. How did that prayer start off? Vague? Timid? That prayer started off this way. Oh, Yahweh, bless me indeed. Enlarge my coast. Let your hand be with me. Keep me from evil that it might not grieve me. And the very next line says, And Yahweh granted him his request. Bold, direct, honest, and sincere. Yeshua said, When you pray, say this, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do not allow us to go into debt, distress, sickness, and disease, and lack, and want. That's bold. Yes. That's honest. That's sincere. That's direct. Yeshua said, what things soever you desire when you pray... Right? What things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Be bold enough to state what you desire and then believe that you receive it. That's what Yeshua said. James said, well, folks, you have not <laughs> because you ask not. And then he said, and if you do ask, you're not getting it because you ask amiss. <clears throat> the word amiss there means, that, that word is interesting, go look it up. That word is often translated in, in the New Testament as the word sick or diseased. So James said, you're not getting what you ask for many times because you're asking for some sick stuff that's connected to your own lust. You can't get away from your own lust far enough to ask for what you ought to ask for. You're asking for some sick stuff and Yahweh's not going to answer that. But the other stuff you're not getting because you won't even ask. If you'll ask for what you need and want outside of your lust, Yahweh will give it to you. So, the question is, when we pray, are we bold, are we direct, are we honest, and are we sincere? I keep going back to the prayer of Jabez. I found that it 
that it's a benefit to me not to be vague. In other words, not to just say, Yahweh bless me indeed. But to slow down enough in the day to envision what that means. What do you want to be blessed with? Make it known. <clears throat> Yahweh bless me with insight, with understanding, with revelation knowledge. Yahweh bless me with eyes that can see and ears that can hear and a heart that can understand. Yahweh bless me with an understanding of the treasures of your word. Reveal them to, them to me. Make them known to me. Cause me to understand your precepts. Bless me indeed. And it's okay to go on. Abraham was rich in what? Gold and silver and cattle. Yahweh bless me indeed with gold and silver. Yahweh bless me with 500 acres. Whatever it is, be bold enough to make it known. This, this is the thing I desire for me and my family. Bless me indeed. Enlarge my coast. What does that mean? Enlarge my influence. Enlarge my platform. Enlarge my voice. Enlarge my ability to teach. Enlarge my ability to understand. Enlarge my ability to communicate. Enlarge, enlarge in so many ways. You see, you can sit and start envisioning what you mean by that. Let your hand be with me. Well, what does it mean for his hand to be with you? To encourage, to strengthen, to empower, to push you forward. Let your hand be with me, forward, uh, fa Father, to protect me and keep me. Oh, Yahweh, keep me from lack and want and debt and distress and from sickness and from disease. And may it be said at the end of our life that people knew we prayed that way. And, and at the end of our life, they have to say, and, and Yahweh granted them their request. Hallelujah. We got to learn to listen to Yahweh on purpose. And we got to pray on purpose. When we're listening to or reading the word, or when a verse gets quickened to our spirit, we need to get a vision of what that looks like. We need to see it, hear it, and embrace it. And when we're praying, we've got to be bold, direct, honest, and sincere. Amen. Prayer is two-way communication. So we got to make sure we develop our ability to hear Yahweh. And that's going to come through slowing down long enough to try to envision what he says in his word. Because his word became a vision. we got to envision what he's saying in his word. And then we've got to also fine tune how we talk to him. Because if we don't, if we're not bold direct, if we're not honest and sincere, then we really never know if he's responding to us or not. But when we get bold and direct, honest and sincere, we can see things begin to transpire in our life. Okay? All right. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As his name is put upon you, so shall he himself bless you. <laughs>